it's time for the big conversations telling stories of movers and shakers of industry giants and daring professionals it's time for the conversations that change your perspective on life the kind of conversations that shape entrepreneurs and move careers forward if you don't know where these conversations are found we are sending you a gps but if you're listening to this voice right now you are here Welcome to the Growth Podcast. This is the GPS. We're back with episode 59 of the Growth Podcast. Welcome to yet another uh, conversation that you will not want to miss out on. Uh, we are counting down to 100 episodes um, of the Growth Podcast. We had an interesting one last week, I think, with Jonah. This week, we are moving into a very special conversation. Um, and it's funny how we came up with this conversation, but I'll give you the details um, a little bit later. My guest uh, this week on the podcast is Daniel Cavani. Um, he is a founder, I don't know if he's founder and CEO or chairman um, of, 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 of uh, DNK. Uh, you tell us what that's about. Welcome to the podcast. We're happy to have you. Thanks so much. It's good to be here. Always following through the the series, and I should say, they're quite enlightening. Yeah, I look forward to this conversation because I think this is going to be a more in depth conversation. I have just um, tapped into your wisdom from a distance. <laughs> but I think it's once that I I I I I, I, I listen to you speak <clears throat> at an event. And you were unpacking the brain and whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but I look forward to this conversation. How have you been? I've been okay. Work is okay and been fine. And it's it's good uh, actually to interact in this space. Again, like I've highlighted, you know, I follow through the, uh, the growth podcast. And I think uh, it's one of those positive forces, especially on social media. We need much of that, especially in this time. Yeah, so no, we're, doing the most. We're, we're trying our best to do the most. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got some icebreaker questions before we go into our conversation. Okay. Um, my first icebreaker <laughs> question is, is tell us about the last book you read and the key lesson you learned from it. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm reading currently an autobiography of Martin Luther King Jr., uh, some young man who went to uh, the U.S. recently, brought for me as a gift. So it's actually what I'm reading. And... Um, there's a statement I read today that says that uh, a person that is morally upright cannot gradually adapt to injustice. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's a whole explanation behind that one. That's, that's question number one. Uh, number two is what habit do you have that you know you must quit, but it's just not happening? Facebooking. You have to quit Facebook. <laughs> I, I don't want to quit Facebook, but I want to quit Facebooking. You know, <clears throat> at some point, when I sit, literally I feel like I'm spending a lot of time on Facebook than I should be spending. And, uh, well, I'm so jealous of my time, very careful with how I spend my time, but I think of late I've not been very careful. Sometimes I overread the comments. I normally feel three, four, five comments are enough to be read on any post, no matter how serious. But then if you find yourself now I'm doing 40, 50 comments, I begin feeling that's a waste of time. So that's one of the habits I need to urgently work on. Okay. If you could go back to when you were a kid, what is one thing you would change? As a kid, wow, that one, let's see what I would change. I think I would experiment more. Of course, I was very experimentative in terms of trying out things in life, sports, science, and all that stuff. But I think sometimes we limit ourselves, and in so doing, we end up not learning much of what we are capable of doing. So there are times that I limited myself in certain uh, aspects, which I think probably if I experimented, I would have learned a bit much more about myself. Okay. Anyway, uh, maybe now we feel like we know you more, but <laughs> I feel like the knowing hasn't even started. I would like us to, to begin by, by, by you telling us a bit about um, yourself. Who are you? Um, mm. If Daniel Cavani is mentioned, um, what, 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 what do you want it to be in connection with? Okay, if Daniel Cavani is mentioned, I want it to be connected to a person that helps every person realize their potential and live to their maximum. I actually, my, my greatest obsession is human development. Uh, 
Now, I may be known to different people by different things, but they all center around one thing, human development. So in the space of um, professional space, People know me as a pharmacist. That's my uh, profession. I'm a pharmacist specialized in human anatomy, so I'm also an anatomist. Um, and then church-wise, people know me as an evangelist. So there are guys who purely just know me as an evangelist. And when they meet me, they go like, pastor. But I'm not a pastor, but I do a lot of preaching. Then within the space of writing, some people know me as an author. I've uh, published uh, three books now, Be Exceptional, Be Irresistible, and uh, Speak Better Than Me. And uh, so some people know me within that aspect. Then in the entrepreneurship space, some people know me as an entrepreneur, so they know DNK Group, they know DNK Pharmacy, DNK General Consultancy, DNK Brand and Publishers, and um, DNK Health and Pharmaceuticals. Uh, so we are active in that space. Then also in academia, I've been active in that space in terms of lecturing. I've taught at Evelyn Horn, Dovecott College, Apex Medical University, a bit also at Unza School of Medicine. So some people know me as their lecturer. So it is all that space. I do a lot of things. But what I want to be known for is a person that is into human development and that is helping every person realize their potential and live to the maximum that they can with that potential. Funny you mentioned that because I think I posted on Facebook some, um, I think about a week <coughs> ago, mm -hmm. and I was saying there are people who know they must be doing more, mm -hmm. okay? And I had a conversation with someone on the phone and they say, look, I, I know I should be doing more. Yes. I know I am not where I should be, mm -hmm. but I'm, not, I'm just not sure what, what more is. Mm -hmm. You get the point? Mm -hmm. I, not, like mm -hmm. I, I can't quantify or qualify yes. this is, okay, more. Uh -huh. How do people live up to their potential? How do I get to, okay, I am here, I want to get here. Mm -hmm. Others know that they are here. Mm -hmm. They can be, but they don't know where they, you, mm -hmm. I don't know if you came a point. Yes. We, I think a few weeks ago, we had that conversation with a few friends of mine. So uh, Dr. Siatwambo had invited me. He often invites me to speak with a few other friends to talk to the pupils in Great North group of schools. So we are having lunch, and that conversation started. I think one of the friends asked to say, I always feel that there is more I can do, but I think I'm doing less, but I don't know how to do that more. And the unfortunate thing is that people are impressed with what I am doing, which I am very sure is less than what I should be doing. Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and guess what? I really think any person that is working to develop themselves has actually had that feeling where it is clear that you, you have a feeling that you are doing less than you could be doing, but then you don't know how to do that. There are a few things that I have learned in life. One of them is if you want to do more, probably, firstly, you must discover your temperament. There are people that are, as an example, in disciplines that don't align with their temperament. You know, psychologists tell us of the four temperaments mainly. Of course, now there is more research that has been done that shows that they go beyond that. But they can all be quantified to four, which is melancholy, cholerics, the phlegmatics, and um, uh, the sanguines. Now, those temperaments are real. And sometimes you could be in a career that is off tangent to your temperament. So you begin to feel you can do more, but you are doing less. Why? You are in a career that does not align with your temperament. Some people are extroverts. Some people are introverts. You go and get a job that requires an extrovert, and yet you are an introvert. That's one of the ways to quickly get frustrated. You go and get a job that requires an introvert and you're an extrovert and suddenly you are frustrated or you begin to feel inadequate. So one of the key things is we need to know ourselves at a temperament level. Then another thing is that our education does not teach us much about um, self-discovery. For example, talents. I strongly believe that God did not give us talents as uh, cosmetic, uh, you know, acquirements. Those talents are supposed to align with what one does in their life. Talents are calculated to make one effective and efficient. 
And many of us are struggling at whatever we do in life, in life because we have not aligned what we are doing, be it business or profession-wise, with our talents. Look at you, Swilanji. You have a strong talent for public speaking. It is natural to you. People struggle with that. And look at your job that you have now. I think it aligns. So I don't expect anything else but for you to thrive. But now somebody might be infatuated with your job who does not have a natural talent for public speaking. And this person is busy applying. Finally, they say, here is the job, madam. And that person continues to embarrass himself day in, day out. Why? He is pursuing a course that is off tangent to their talent. And lastly, how can we get to a space where we do more? We need mentors. When you look at any great person in this life, they have had mentors. You go in the line of uh, philosophy. We know of the great philosophers such as Aristotle, Plato, and Socrates. And then you bring in Alexander the Great. All these guys, one mentored the other, the other mentored the other, the other mentored the other. And they are producing a chain of greatness. Because mentors have been, to a certain degree, they have been where you want to be, but you have not been there yet. Atma Gandhi, Nelson Mandela. A line of mentorship. So whether you go in politics, you go in science, and we get ourselves now. Our generation is a generation that often does not want to be told anything. So everybody wants to be a mentor to themselves. But probably if we engaged more people that have gone ahead of us, they can help us with some of the bottlenecks we face in our lives. How does one go about getting a mentor? Because the truth is, and we've had a number of discussions around this, but I want to get your perspective because mm -hmm. <clears throat> there are a lot of young people, one, who are very thirsty for a mentor, mm -hmm. but it is not as easy to get a mentor. That's true. Um, how do I go about getting a mentor? And then also, once I have a mentor, how, how does a mentor-mentee relationship effectively work? Because I can have a mentor, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. <laughs> someone who has no mentor is doing better than you because you're not That's using true. it to the fullest. That's very true. How you, are, you catch the attention of a mentor, number one, people that can qualify to be called mentors are attracted by performance. They're also attracted by discipline because nobody wants somebody whose life is falling apart, going around town, telling people that that man is my mentor. <laughs> <laughs> right? It becomes a scandal. So mentors have built their reputation. And any person that has worked, you have built a reputation. I have built a reputation. You understand what that takes. And you guard your reputation jealously. So if a young person wants to then associate himself and to be going around town telling people to say, Suilanji is my mentor, what would you expect of that young man? <laughs> Nothing other than top-notch performance and discipline. Now, most young people tend to fail. The truth is actually people that qualify to be mentors also are very happy to find some young man who is a top performer so that they can say, that's my mentee, right? At a certain level of self-actualization, we find pride in pointing at people that we have met, people that we have helped in their journey become whatever else. So if a young man, a young lady wants to get a mentor, there are certain things they must to commit to. Number one, it is discipline. Many of our young people are not disciplined, and I'm going to explain what that means. Discipline is ability to stick to the process. Now, if you want to become any great person, there is a process to becoming. I think the late uh, Mr. Galam Galamkani wrote and said, we don't just become. That's a fact. Any person who has gone through this understands. There is a process to anything. There is a behind the scenes that people don't see. Now, here's the thing. There are many young people right now who would want to be Suilanji or like Suilanji. There are many young people who would want to be like Daniel Kavan. Do they know what Suilanji has been through? That's number one. Number two, are they willing to go through that process? I don't know about you, but I know about myself that there were offices we went to and nobody wanted to listen to us. Doors were closed. We bent the candle in the night. You are awake and you are working. There's a lot of reading. A person like you is well read. You spend time obviously reading. I have bought materials and read. The Daniel Cavani scene today is a product of the process of years.
many young people now want a shortcut. So even when they would approach a person like me and say, I want you to be my mentor, what rings in my mind very quickly is, is this young person saying, I want to be like you as the end product minus the process. Or this young person is saying, I want to go through the process so that I become like you or better than you. So there are very few that can endure that uh, discipline. And that's where the challenge actually comes in. Because like I've said, you want to attach your reputation or a brand to somebody that is consistent, somebody that is hardworking, somebody that is disciplined. Here's a young person who says, I want to be your mentor. You go and vet them on Facebook. And the person is dancing from morning to evening, one video after the other. Can you attach yourself to that young person. Now, somebody might argue to say, probably that's why they need mentors. <laughs> <laughs> that's I'm a good saying, point. Yeah. That's a good point. <laughs> I'm saying, that's why that very person actually uh, needs a mentor. Well, that's... It's like, it's like Jesus came for the sinners. <laughs> yeah, so. came for the sinners. <laughs> so that's true. But young people need to understand that, that there's a certain level of self-development you should be willing to do for people to admit you in their circles. The easiest way to catch a mentor is study them. Study what they are interested in. What do they spend their time in? What are they investing in? What are the social community programs they do? After you have studied them, create an opportunity for yourself to meet them. Now, that opportunity may not be created by going to ask for an appointment because some of these people are very huge. They are very busy. For you to go and say, I want to meet him, they say there's bureaucracy between you and them. But how do you do? I normally tell young people, every big person is looking for an extra hand. There are things you are doing that you're looking for an extra, a free extra hand. And I agree with you because... Um I'll be very honest with you. For the uh -huh. longest time, I, I used to edit this podcast on my own. Uh -huh. um, I think <clears throat> until last week, this, yeah. this young man comes to me and tells me, no, I want to be helping you on the podcast. I can edit. I can do ABCD. Um, and he says, I don't want you to pay me, um, but I want to attach my, he's got a small media company. Uh -huh. I want to attach my small media company um, like at the end of every video, like we just advertise. That's yeah. what I want. Yes. Okay. And I, I understand you when you say, uh -huh. you, you need a hand, mm -hmm. but you don't go out there announcing that, yeah, oh, like I need help. I need, no. <laughs> exactly. So it's really, I, I mm -hmm. agree with you because mm -hmm. it really takes you knowing someone mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I follow you. I've noticed this is lacking. I can mm -hmm. feel this voice. Yes. That's what brilliant young people do. Let me give you just a, a very practical example. I'll cite one young man, a uh, brilliant young man by the name of Abel Hangoba. I don't know whether you know him. He's, um, he goes by the name Radical Farmer on yes, Facebook. Yes, Radical the Farmer, I know the, the, farmer, the right? name, I don't know. Yes, that young man is doing a lot of great stuff, brilliant young man. I met him, I think, in 2018. How did I meet him? There was a conference at Mungushi where I was speaking. After I finished speaking, people came getting selfies and all that stuff. You know what happens. I saw that there was a young man standing at a distance the whole time until everybody left. Then the young man came and introduced himself. He said, I'm Abel Hangom. And, um, well, what you have shared here is mind-blowing. I feel my life has changed. You have impacted me. I would want to do one thing for you as a way of saying thank you. And what I would want to do is I would want to design a website, a personal website for you, and a website for your company because I'm actually a computer scientist and I can do that. Who can refuse that? Uh, yeah, I actually remember a young man. He came for the breakfast for champions. Oh, yeah? Offered me the same thing. Then you he see? Was right. Yes. And you see, I, I, I accepted because I needed that. He went on to do that. And guess what? From there, he suggested another thing. Now, if, if people search Daniel Cavani on YouTube, they'll see some old videos that are there. All those videos were shot and edited by Abel Hangoma for free. He says, I'm going to be coming every week once to shoot. And when he's shooting with me, then we begin discussing business. That time he was working with Riverside. So I started mentoring him in business for free because I felt indebted to him for what he had done. Many young people want to be paid even before they demonstrate their value. Now, nobody pays you for assumed value. You are paid for demonstrated value. Go deeper. Yes. Now, if young people can understand that, um, here's a typical example. I said that I worked for Evelyn Horn for three years, right? Yes. In that three years, I was not paid anything. 
I went and asked to volunteer and teach at Evelyn Horn for free. Now, if I went and said, can you pay me? I want to come here. They would have set the bar very high for me to prove that I meet the criteria to teach at Evelyn Horn and why I should be paid. But because I presented that I can teach for free, the bar is lowered so I can be admitted. Then that allows me a chance to prove my value. So I was given that chance. I taught at Evelyn Horn. But guess what that does? When Apex Medical University now advertised and said, we want people that can come in. We will get you with your degree and send you to Unza for a master's. We'll sponsor that master's for you. Now everybody wanted to apply. I applied there. When I went for those interviews, the directors asked me, highly qualified guys, these professors, and say, young man, why should we consider you for this? I said, I have experience. I look young, but I've taught at Zambia's biggest college for three years. And they were shocked. They said, at your young age, you have taught at Evelyn Horn? They said, young man, you are the kind we are looking for. And we are taking you as an SDF. I came out of that office knowing clearly that I had the job. What did I do? I looked for a gap. I volunteered. I demonstrated my value. My value may not have paid there and then, but it paid in the long run. This is what young people should understand. So the challenge is when they meet the people they think can mentor them, instead of offering, they are asking. Don't go and ask. Go and offer. Then demonstrate your value. Then later on, you will be paid for the value you have provided. Wow. Uh so now the 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 the, the mentor mentee relationship has been established. Mm -hmm. What happens now? I've volunteered. I've yes. what what now? How do I draw the value from you, my mentor? From the mentor. Now I, I should also mention a few cautions to young people that might be following. That uh, in that relationship of mentor mentee, do not. Do not turn yourself, maybe for lack of a better term, I would say, do not turn yourself into an inconvenience or a nuisance to your mentor. Here is what I mean. When somebody begins to mentor you, firstly, what they expect is that whatever you are learning from them, you go and implement. Then you come back to report with the results of how things are moving. There are young people who today, when you accept and say, oh, I'm going to be your mentor, they get your line. And they'll be calling you 15 times a day. Every day you are getting a call. Now, you are very busy. And I know that you wouldn't want that. Somebody who is calling you in the morning and, oh, no, I've just finished eating breakfast. Now I'm going for work. Is that <laughs> necessary, that report? Is it necessary? <laughs> no, it is not. So in that relationship, it should be understood very well. Number one, it should be understood that this person, I'm the protege, I'm the protege who is being mentored by the mentor. This person who is mentoring me is a busy person. Our interaction time might be limited. Anytime, if, if it is a structured mentorship where you have particular times when you meet, every time you go and meet, you must prepare yourself with specific questions you are going to go and ask. That's if it is structured. So whenever you go and meet, you meet. There's a young man I met. He was just meeting me this morning. And when he comes... He was telling me this question. He was saying, so, uh, Mr. Kabane, I've seen how you run your businesses very well with your wife. Could you kindly guide me? Because right now with my wife, we are also setting up our business. How can we run the business effectively? This young man has come with a very specific question and he knows what he's doing. And you know what shows seriousness? Immediately I begin to speak to him. He notebook. pulls out a notebook. Yeah. Uh, the notebook part... Uh -huh. uh, there's somewhere I went where they said, if, 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 if you value it, you write it down. Yes. But you find people just so looking at you. <laughs> it just becomes a staring competition. It's just looking at you. It's just looking at you. And you're wondering, is it, you know? staring competition. Yeah. It, write it down, you know? Exactly. And then also, I'm happy you mentioned that because I think um, when, mm -hmm. I, when, I, when we spoke earlier, mm -hmm. um, I told you... Um, I would like us to talk about something you are passionate about. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you mentioned, I am very passionate about talking about how couples can run businesses. Mm -hmm. um, they can support each other in their mm -hmm. personal development and whatnot. And I had that in the back of my mind, even as we're having this conversation. Mm -hmm. But then I'm like, wait, uh, let me milk as much from you <laughs> as I can. We'll get to the couple a bit later. But, but you've mentioned it. But, but, but while you are, you, you're still on it, um, 
I know you were talking about, you know, writing it down. Mm-hmm. Maybe let's pick it up from there because mm-hmm. my wife always tells me um, she likes how even after I stop you, mm-hmm. people were following what you were saying. Mm-hmm. So I don't want to look like I confuse them. <laughs> so I want you to continue. <laughs> and then I'll, I'll get in, but I had to throw okay. that in. Yeah, so this young man pulls the notebook and he's writing. What does that communicate to me? Firstly, it communicates that this young man takes what I am saying very seriously. Imagine if he was busy swinging on the chair and yawning and looking at my pictures while I'm talking. Then he asks, ah, this picture, you are in South Africa. It, it, it communicates lack of seriousness. But he sits and he's writing. And you see, he clearly demonstrates that he values my time because throughout the conversation, he continues to say one line and say, sir, I, I don't really want to keep you, to, to occupy your time more than necessary because I know you are very busy. But I had this one more question. So that tells you this is a young man who values my time with him and he takes this. And every time we meet, he comes back with a report. What we discussed last time, I went and did this and this and this. At a certain level in this life, our satisfaction stops being monetary. It becomes the lives we have changed. If somebody can testify and say, what he advised me, this is what I did. What I learned from him, that brings satisfaction. And this is what majority of mentors are actually uh, looking. So it should not just turn into name dropping where you want to keep meeting somebody and getting pictures and saying, look, this is actually my mentor. Maybe you are drinking somewhere and you pull your phone and say, you see me and my mentor last week as we met. So that's how young, young people must actually utilize it. And sometimes, how do you drive value? Go and work on a business plan. Send to your mentor and say, I know you are busy, but in your spare time, if you could just look through that, give a comment on it and and tell me how it is. You are driving value. How do you drive value? In the projects that you are making, your mentor can now become a recommendation that you are actually making. How do you drive value? If you are running programs, when you are running programs, you can bring your mentor. That's borrowed credibility. It's brand association. People can now say, oh, if what this young man is doing, Mr. So-and-so also shows up, probably he's a young man of, of substance. To certain meetings he goes, just ask whether it is to carry his back. As you reach there, he introduces you and say, this is my mentee, so and so so What happens is this. The next time you meet with that person whose circle you could not get in because probably he's in a higher social strata, the next time you meet him, you introduce yourself by your mentor's name and he receives you the way he would have received your mentor. I like borrowed credibility. Um, Mm -hmm. And and for those that may not fully understand borrowed credibility, um, the best example I can give you is, you know that thing where you you don't know someone, right? Mm -hmm. And then you get their number. Yeah. So you just go and say, hi, how are you? Like, you know each other. Oh, yeah. I wanted to ask. No, no, no. I want to get my number. I get a point. So borrowed credibility is, hello? Yes. Mr. Banda? Yes. I, 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 I got your number from President Ichilem. Yes. Just the fact that the president gave you my number. Uh-huh. No, okay, maybe the president is exaggerating. Even just saying, oh, look, I got your number from Daniel Kawani or I got your number from Chuamba Kanyama. He uh-huh. told me I should see you. Just that name dropping. It changes It changes everything. everything. No, I got you up on Facebook. It's, 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 it's not a common. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I really get a bit about the borrowed credibility. But then also, mm-hmm. the other thing is not everyone will successfully get hold of a mentor. That's true. How do I still achieve a significant uh, level of personal development yes, on my own? Yes, 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 yes. And, and that's a very vital issue for us to address. And it goes to how you use your time. Our young people, especially in our country, need a lot of help. And when I say our country, some people might say sometimes maybe we want to paint our countries in negative light or not. No, I think you and I, Sri Lanka, are well-traveled and we have sampled a few countries to know what is happening there. I'll tell you that I've been involved in programs, for example, funding programs. Anybody can go and look. Let me give very popular funding programs that are present currently. One of them is the Tony Melo Foundation uh, yeah. Funding. The other one is one which is done by Strive Masiwa and Jack Ma. Okay? Those are funding to Africans. 
And every year, young people are getting free money grants to run businesses. Last time I was looking at the statistics in terms of distribution across African countries. Do you know that, Suilanji? I was looking at the statistics of the other year. In Zambia, we had like 23 people who applied for that. Do you know how many applied from Nigeria? Over 3,000 youths applied. And here, 23. I was attending, uh, I was speaking actually at a conference in Johannesburg, I think some two years ago. It was a philanthropy conference. And uh, mainly it is young people that were there. How many Zambians were there? Two. I had myself three. But how many people crossed from Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, Ethiopia, and were present there as young people? Our youths need to move from where they are preoccupied by scandals on social media, where they are first booking themselves into poverty. That is what is occupying this country. You go in, they are busy from morning to afternoon. This one insulted that one. This one is what? And they are busy. You know, one thing I've come to conclude is this. For example, one of the ways to develop yourself, you don't have a mentor, is through reading. Buy books and read. I continuously buy books. I tell people knowledge does not move by diffusion. From a region of high concentration to a region of low <laughs> concentration. You know, knowledge moves actively. You must be deliberate about knowledge acquisition. And research over and over has indicated that the more you learn, the more you earn. There is a correlation between your status of life and how much you know. Whether it is in business, business runs on knowledge. It does not run on money. It runs on knowledge. Marriage runs on knowledge. Everything in this life is sustained by knowledge. But question is, how much knowledgeable are our people? You go in these productive forums, you don't see them there. Look at how many programs are, are channeled out by the American embassy. When you just go to their Facebook page, funding programs, many of them, and, and our young people are not there. Go and check, you're going to see five likes. One comment, zero share. Go where there is a scandal. See how many likes, how many shares, how many counterattacks within there. So you can mentor yourself if nobody takes you in. By one, reading, buy books. Books now are even cheaper. There are websites like www.pdf drive. Knowledge is cheap. With a five quacha, you can download a hundred books and read yourself out of your situation. Number two, YouTube. There is so much content on YouTube, free content. And I think in one of the podcasts that I was watching that you did, you called it the University of YouTube. I, I, I yeah. think I still remember something like that. There's so much positive content on YouTube in any discipline you'd want to pick. You can read that. Thirdly, attending programs. This goes to conferences. It goes to workshops that you can. Fourthly, it goes to short courses. You can mentor yourself through that. We have Udemy, we have Allison, we have Coursera. Good All room. these are platforms that have got free courses. So you can, and, and the mentors you love, if you can't reach them, buy their books. One of the people that I can consider my mentor is Ben Carson. I've read all his books. Think Big, uh, Big Picture, Gifted Hands, America the Beautiful, and all that. So you can buy the books of these guys and read. There's one great book I love. It is called Highways to Learning, written by John Snyder. And John Snyder says that when we read books, we interact with great minds and we make their thoughts our own. He says when you sit and you are reading books, sometimes I, I jokingly tell my siblings and I would say, to say, I've gone to have a chat with Trump. Like, where are you going to meet Trump? <laughs> but look, when I go and read a book by Trump, and, it, and this is what happens. I always tell people that actually, given a chance, whether to meet a great person or to read his book, give me his book. If I meet a great person, what are the chances that my conversation with that great person will be about great ideas? He's the one who leads the conversation. He may just begin to decide to begin cracking jokes with me. <laughs> After that, he says, bye, he's gone. But men put the best of their ideas in books. When you read a man's book, you are reading the very best of that man. 
Yeah, I, I agree with you on, on the books, eh? Um, and like you said, right now, really, there is no excuse. No. Like, there's no excuse mm. for, I can't afford a book, 200 <laughs> kwacha is too much. No. Uh, that PDF drive you mentioned, um, yeah. it's a game changer. Whether it's, it's academic, changer. it's what, everything it's everything. Everything is there. Everything is there. Um, you mentioned something I, I feel is very important, and I'd like you to maybe shed a bit more light. You say business runs on knowledge, not money. Exactly. In Zambia, there's no capital. <laughs> <laughs> Niche capital to run a business. The, the, the knowledge is, is something strange. And we, we are hearing it for the first time. We, we know capital. The business has to be fluid. And you know, sometimes <laughs> most people say, is he a motivational yeah, speaker? I'm a, well, I, I started I, this business with one rice. <laughs> This chicken it, it's it's important for feathers. people to know that what we are speaking here is what we have handled and what we are doing. We are running viable, tangible businesses on the ground and not virtual uh, businesses that may not be seen. Um, here is, I want to just demonstrate how knowledge sets people apart. If you do not have the knowledge of surgery, you get a knife and open somebody's chest, you'll be arrested. It is called attempted murder. If you go into school for seven years, then you do four years and learn and get the same knife and open somebody's chest, it's not attempted murder, it's called an operation. What differentiates whether you're going in prison or people will praise you after that is what? Is it the hands? Is it the instrument used? It's the knowledge. So. One guy, by having subjected himself to knowledge, he knows that when I get this knife and I go in here, when I cut here, it's life. When I cut here, it's death. The other person does not know. When they cut in there, it is definitely death. Here's the thing. There is a statistics that was done by what is called the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor. This is actually the biggest entrepreneurship survey that is normally done on Earth. It's sponsored by the uh, government of Canada, and they do it from time to time. So it's a survey where they'll take a number of countries and pick about a thousand entrepreneurs in there and do a research. A few years ago, it was done, and the person who was leading it actually here is Professor Chikunta, who then was the economic advisor to uh, President, I think it should be Rupia Banda. And they sampled out a number of countries across Africa. It's an entrepreneurship survey to find out how is entrepreneurship working, why is it failing. There are very interesting things that were found in that study, and people could Google and, and actually look at it. Number one. That study found out that in Africa, as at that point, which is, I think, some seven or so years ago, Zambia was the most entrepreneurial country in Africa. We have more entrepreneurs by proportion than any other country in Africa. Number two, they found that more people in Zambia get into entrepreneurship than any other country in Africa. Number three, they found that in terms of our being risk-averse, Okay? Ours was very low. There were more Zambians ready to jump on the bandwagon of entrepreneurship than any other country. Actually, most of them claimed that why they are not entrepreneurs, even those that were not, is just that they don't have capital. But on the downside of this survey, what did it find? Number one, Zambia was the leading country with the most business failure than any other country in Africa. So while we had more people going in business, we had more businesses failing than any other country. <clears throat> so the survey went on to find out why were businesses failing in Zambia. One of the leading causes was to establish that people don't have what are called entrepreneurship skills, which is knowledge. Now, let me give it as an example. Have you realized that the default setting of our parents is that when they get their pension, they go in business, isn't it? Farming. Farming, which is a business. And what happens three years later? The whole pension is gone. That case on its own just demonstrates. And that's not little money. Somebody's saying, I'm not in business because I need a 15,000. Well, we can show a thousand cases of retirees that received 1.7 million, 700,000 kwacha, and three years down the line. The cars they brought and said these will be taxis, what is happening to them? They are now potteries. Seated on rocks and, cars and, and chickens are in there. 
everything has been run down. The, the farm looks like a museum now. Oh, this used to be a tractor. That used to be what? What does that demonstrate? Why have the businesses failed? They have failed because there are no entrepreneurship skills. And I'll cite a few of them so that this is practical. If you do not know how to calculate profitability for your business, you are not ready to start a business. Go and ask an average person running a business there and say, what are your profit margins on this business? They have no clue. Ask them even just what their running costs are. What are your monthly running costs? They can't answer that question. Many of us even run businesses out of passion. Now, what sustains a business is what might keep you for long in business is a passion. But what grows a business is not passion. It is knowledge. Again, because, for example, so you, you don't know whether you are profitable or not. That business has potential to take you into debt. I tell people that entrepreneurship is dangerous. And there are many lives that have been destroyed by entrepreneurship. Actually, I should also cite that there are more successful people in formal jobs than in entrepreneurship. Yeah. I just learned people are getting paid my two million. I didn't know. Oh, yeah. People getting paid two million kwacha. I was like, what? So, uh, knowledge is everything. C can I give an example? Is for example, there are people that know how to source. Even when you talk about capital, you don't have capital because you don't have knowledge. When you have knowledge, capital shows up. I can give an example. Number one, when you know that you can monetize. You can monetize your knowledge or your skills. You can use your knowledge or skills monetized to raise capital. One of the things we do as a consulting firm is just to sell knowledge. Right now, I'm running a mentorship program. As a company, we're running a mentorship program. That one of them is a public speaking mentorship program where each person pays a 2,000 kwacha. What am I selling? It's knowledge. We have a program where we are mentoring young people in terms of uh, how to make yourself employable by having all these soft skills that employers are looking for. What are we selling? It is knowledge. How much capital do you need for you to start something like that? So it is possible to monetize your knowledge. Then secondly, sometimes you need to hire yourself out to raise the capital that you are claiming you want. The unfortunate thing is this. An average youth that we have has very high standards for themselves that don't actually match with the reality of their case. How many young people that are not doing anything currently can go and say, okay, I am willing to begin working here as a maid to clean? Can I give you an example? One young man showed up at our office and said, sir, I want to be cleaning outside. I asked him, what are your qualifications? He says, I hold a degree. That was shocking. Already that catches your attention. Gave the young man to be sweeping. He finishes sweeping out very quickly. And after he finishes, it's all neat. He comes inside and says, I don't know if I can help out on the tasks that are inside here. Before you know it, he has a job. Before you know it, he can serve. Before you know it, that saving can begin for him a business. Now, we have young people that have done nothing, experimented with nothing, raised nothing. They want you to give them your money that you have sweated for so that they experiment with it in the idea they are claiming to be entrepreneurship. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> You're not mincing your words, eh? <laughs> I wish I, I could. But I think we need to be very truthful with majority of our young people. And by the way, talking about entrepreneurship, let me say that entrepreneurship is not an escape for laziness. You know, for example, you get young people who say, ah, no, eh, sir, you inspire me. Actually, we are soon joining you. I also want to be my own boss. <laughs> and the idea of being your own boss is that you, you wake up at uh, nine hours, you report at work at 10 hours, and no one is asking you. <laughs> Very weird. Now, you have interacted with part of my team that I've come with here. You should ask them what time I report at the office. What if time does I report at the office? You live at 04? Sometimes. If you ask the Bivid today, they will tell you that they found me at the office. If you ask them whether yesterday I found them at the office, they found me at the office. I reported six. But I'm the boss. I have nobody to fire me. But that's the time I report. And I work, they knock off at 17, and they leave me in the office working. Now, here's the thing. You get young people that 
see when their boss, where they are currently working, ask them just to work a little bit beyond 17. No, we are being abused. This is why we should be this our own is, bosses. This place is toxic. It's toxic. <laughs> <laughs> it's toxic. You know, it's not good for your mental health. Right? <laughs> and and these young people now are assuming. I tell, one time I was speaking to a young man by engine filling station. So I find him because I've decided to knock off that time and I think it was about 23 so I go there to do a little transaction. Then I tell him to say, oh, you are working in the night. He says, Sir, I came here from uh, 10 hours and I'm here. So I could see he was speaking in a way that he wanted me to sympathize with him. Then I told him to say, you are privileged. If you ever hope to own something of your own that you are going to run, consider yourself privileged that you can be in an environment that requires you to work up to 23. Because I can tell you that there is no successful entrepreneur that works eight hours. None. I was reading a biography about uh, Dangote. Okay? This is the richest black man on earth. And this writer who has written about Dangote, in his interview, he asks him how many hours he works in a day. And this man, Dangote, replies and says he works 17 hours in a day. This is the richest man on earth and he works 17 hours in a day. And by the way, the work ethics you are currently demonstrating in whatever job you have is what you will demonstrate over your things. The Bible says that if you have not been faithful in the things of others, who will give your own portion? And the Bible says, he that is little, he's, he that is faithful in little will be given to be in charge of much. Here's the thing. The law and principle God has put behind success is this. God is not extravagant. God is a steward. He manages his resources very well. He's an economist. God only takes you to the next level when you have demonstrated capacity for the next level. You want to, the, to move to the next level? While you are at this level, begin demonstrating capacity for the next level. You are claiming you want to be a manager. You report for work at 8.30. How will you supervise people? You want to be a supervisor. You want to be whatever. So we must build capacity. And this is what young people must be taught. If you are ever thinking of crossing to the world of entrepreneurship, I want to tell you the reality that most people don't say. Number one, if you are a person given to appetite, who can't miss a meal, you are almost collapsing, people have to hold you, <laughs> then stay away. In the world of entrepreneurship, you will miss meals first, where you, you literally can feel the hunger. But you say, I can't eat now because eating now would be wasting time. Especially in the early stages of entrepreneurship, you will definitely have to part with your sleep. Entrepreneurship is in an economy you don't control, where factors are unpredictable. You can live with everything working very well. Then you are just told that, sir, just when you le left, some thieves broke in and, and, and stole. You can't say, oh, we, we'll see that tomorrow at six hours. So it, it brings in everything. There's a level of commitment, and it is only when you have demonstrated already at the job that you have, that you are responsible, you are hardworking, you are disciplined. You can make sacrifices then you can. I actually tell people that uh, if I'm to be a bit more blunt, I tell people this, that if you are lazy, don't start a business. Go and look for a job. Because you will not survive in business. Business is brutal. I sit in my office sometimes seated discussing with business partners at zero two. And then I begin asking myself, what is everybody doing? There are times I drive around Lusaka here and the whole Lusaka is quiet. People are sleeping. So that's, that's what I may share to those that are considering the path of entrepreneurship. There are those that, um, and I've seen quite a number of them, that are in a full-time job, but also enterprising. I yes. run my saloon, I do mm -hmm. this, I do that, I mm -hmm. do that. Which is good. Um, but then also, ultimately, at some point, you begin to face the temptation to fully cross over. Mm -hmm. How do you prepare for that process? And how do you know the time is ripe? Uh, and maybe just to say, you see, this is why I love your podcast. 
is uh, the issues that you tackle and the questions that you ask. And and I'll encourage the viewers, if people really follow and listen to actually what you do here, many people would be saved from many things. Now, I came from, uh, I had a job. Then I quit and I went into entrepreneurship. This is what I tell people this time around. If you have a job, thank God, and go and give tithe and offering next week on Sunday. Thank him that you have a job. Don't jump around with the euphoria of entrepreneurship that is not based on sound knowledge and judgment. Otherwise, your story will be the 21st century version of the story of the prodigal son. Where you will go back to your employer, apologize, cry in the office, roll on the ground and say, please, let me have my job back. Here's the thing. It takes on average here in Zambia at minimum three years for a business to break even. Don't be lied to. I doubt. Well, I'm a consultant in business. We have been, sorry, in the SME development sector for quite a long time. We have trained SMEs with leading us organization FHI 360, Minister of Youth and all that. And we're active in this space. We know what is happening in there. On average, it takes a minimum, if you are very efficient and knowledgeable, three years for your business to become profitable. The first three, four to five years of your business, you must be ready to continue putting in money in a business that is not producing out money. So you don't go and get a loan, then come to your boss and say, sir, uh, make a phone and say, bye. We have gone to become our own <laughs> bosses. <laughs> Why? You have gotten a loan. No, you don't do that. And I tell people, if you want to transition from formal employment to running a business, begin running a side hustle. Continue running it until it demonstrates profitability. And you should know this because sometimes the danger is this. When you're running a side hustle and you have a, 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 a job, you may not know that it is being sustained by your salary. The money you continue to push in it. And you may think it is actually viable until you quit and now there's no salary to inject in. Then you go down. So run that business until that business has demonstrated at minimum six months consistently of generating a profit. And that profit from the money you are generating, there should be enough money to pay you a salary. A salary, and you should be able to calculate how you get your salary from the money and know that this money belongs to the business, then this is my salary. When it would have reached at that point, then go and quit your job. And when you go and quit your job, go and quit it in the most amicable way. That allows for you to come back in case of anything. Don't go and burn bridges. But don't just get excited. You attended a conference or you listened to Daniel Cavani. Now we have going to be entrepreneurs. You resign your job. It will be a sad case. We have dealt with many young people. Do you know that some people now have become, some of the people you see attacking people who, who, who are proponents of entrepreneurship on Facebook. If you follow the people that are attacking, behind them are sad stories of painful experiences of entrepreneurship. So don't just quit. Begin, become profitable. Then when you have demonstrated that, you can then quit and stick to the business. Wow. Um, and then also, how do you, because like you say, it's, it's a side hustle. Mm -hmm. But then again, how do you balance the two? I know the Bible says mm -hmm. you can't serve two masters. One must suffer. <laughs> sure. So should the side hustle suffer when I'm looking at it as the future? <laughs> you get the point. <laughs> or should the job suffer? The job suffer since it's the past. <laughs> <laughs> That's equally a very uh, important issue for us to, to address. Build systems. Build systems. If you asked my team here, we have systems in our business. Those systems allow for things to happen even if I am not there. There are times I'm out of this country and the business runs. Why? There are systems. And as early as you begin your business, begin to build systems. Immediately you bring in a second person. How, what do we mean when we say build systems? Automate and write down processes that you normally do, how they should be done, so that even if you are not there, 
Somebody can do them. When you begin the business, you will be everything in that business. When I started uh, our businesses now, and by the way, I started, uh, yeah, I was everything. I was the gut. I was the person sweeping. I was the PA. I was literally everything. It used to look like a joke. I remember one person coming in and they found me seated on a stool. There was little nothing in the office except a stool. Curtains I was using were those for lessons which were given to me by my older brother's wife. And uh, a stool that was given to me by my older brother. If you come to our office now, you find I keep some stools just as a reminder of where we come from. And somebody comes in and he looks around and says, Hey, consultants, how are you doing? <laughs> now you can tell that this consultant is uh, for my setting, you know? Yeah. You know the thing. But the thing is this. One thing I quickly began to do was to document everything I was doing. Because at that point, I'm the one who was doing it. So I knew how I wanted it to be done. So I documented how marketing should be done. I documented how what should be done. If you ask my team, any person who joins any of our companies go undergoes at minimum a one-week orientation that is a full program running from 8 to 17 on a daily basis, they are issued with a number of things. Number one, an employee's handbook. That employee's handbook has policies within it and everything. Okay? Those are systems. There's a contract. People sign whether you're on probation or you are confirmed. Then they have what are called SOPs. These are standard operating procedures that say how everything should be done. So what that will do is that it will then give you time. It allows you to be off your business and yet your business is working. Now, when we don't have do that, what that creates is that the business becomes people dependent and not systems dependent. So it is dependent on you. If they have to send a quotation, they have to wait for you to come. So now, how much do we quote this one? You begin, oh, okay, no, I'll quote him, and you give the quote. Show them what is the system for you to develop a quote so that even if you are not there, a quote can be generated. So I think that's how I advise people to take their side, side hustles. Wow, um, that that really says, says a lot. But but then also there's, uh, and I always ask this to people who are running their own businesses, mm -hmm. and I want to get your perspective um, around aligning your employees. Oh yeah, you've built the systems. You know where the business is going. There is a vision. We're not That's here to true. play. I want this same thing to be communicated to mm -hmm. everyone that works for the organization, mm -hmm. so that. I am not pulling in a different direction. I want to go this side, the staff. No, we don't want to go this side. That's true. Uh, you know, let me mention that the greatest challenge actually of any business is human resource. The greatest challenge you will face in business is the human resource. Here's another statement that I often share. Majority of our youths in Zambia are not only unemployed. They are unemployable. We have two types of unemployed youths. Those that are unemployed and employable, and those that are unemployed and unemployable, and they are the majority. I will tell you that at any given point, there are jobs. There are jobs in Zambia. Right now, today, there are institutions. You are, you, you, you are sitting in a very high level within the corporate space, so you understand this institutions have openings, but how to find the right person for that opening is where the problem is. Uh, there is this guy, he's Fred Swanick, I think he runs a university called ALU. Some young, brilliant African, and uh, there's something they have introduced. I remember that he published a study recently that was showing how many jobs are currently vacant in Africa, and there were in millions why are these jobs vacant? Finding the right person. Look at this program you are doing here. If I asked you, Sui Lanch, was it easy for you to find a youth skilled to produce a video that will not look like somebody was running with a, with a phone at some riot? <laughs> <laughs> to produce a high quality production like this, was it easy? How many of our youths have this skill? Beginning with those <laughs> that have graduated from, uh, from university in the disciplines they claim they have. 
I once went to an event with a young lady who was working with us at some point with the, a bachelor's in uh, journalism and I think mass communication, something like that. And I was speaking at that event. I was at the high table. This is a graduate of mass communication, cannot adjust the tripod stand, and she was forcing it. Where I'm seated, I'm just hearing, co -co 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 -co, and I know that <laughs> that tripod is getting broken. But because I'm at the high table, I can't do you. <laughs> so I'm just forced to smile. Well, I know we are making a loss. <laughs> but this is a person who claims they have graduated in that discipline. We were laughing the other day with uh, Mwala. Uh, Mwala is uh, your friends, and he's my young brother. In, yeah, in, I, I, in, I, I was, I was, I was together with his um, his elder brother, Tivlin Hon. Yes, yeah. he's, he's he's my brother in marriage. He's married my young uh, sister. So one time he, he was showing me something. He has a graduate of accounts, writing a letter. To the bank, he says, write a letter to the bank, do, do, do this and, and address. And the person writes a letter. The letter just begins and says, dear bank, <laughs> 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 we want to do this and this and this. Look at what I am saying. So really, the human resource problem must be addressed. And, and we may not blame our youths that much. There's a study that was published by SNV in 2013. That shows that there's a 15 years skills mismatch between a graduate we get today and what the industry is demanding. So any person you get today who claims to be a degree holder, the information they have is 15 years outdated to what the industry is looking for. So how do we align? A number of things must happen. Number one, if you're going to run a business, you must invest in your staff in terms of trainings. If you ask my teams, there is a weekly training. Just some two days ago, I think I was having a training with them on uh, customer care service and something like that. We are deliberate about that. And beyond that also, we have what is called a personal development plan that we actually ask every one of our employees to, to, to come up with. What are the things that you think you must know for your job for you to be able to deliver as you should deliver? Of these, which ones do you think we can sponsor? Which ones are free? Which ones can you sponsor yourself? Because literally, if your human resource is not skilled, your human resource is what will run the business down. So there must be deliberate trainings. But beyond trainings, you as the business owner also should share the vision clearly to your company. Where are we headed as a company? Are we collapsing tomorrow? Because if your staff are thinking that this company we might wake up next week and find we have closed, they definitely can't give the 100%. They're always looking for jobs. Yes, they, are, they begin to look for other things. So that, that is important. But also your recruiting process should be vigorous to weed off the people you don't need and the people you need. For example, here's the thing. Yesterday I was looking at a CV of a certain young lady who, in four years, in four years, she has had eight jobs. She's on demand. <laughs> 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 and you know, the funny thing is, and, and this is what we are talking about when we say a business runs based on knowledge. When you are an entrepreneur, but you have not, my background is medical. But I've taken time to read even on human resource quite heavily. When you see somebody who comes with a CV where in four years she has been at four, uh, four, uh, eight jobs, that explains instability on the part of this person. That's if you are knowledgeable where human resource is concerned. If you are not, to you that's experience. Say, ah, let's get this one. As ex you also <laughs> worked at ShopRite. Yeah, 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 yeah. Even pick and pay. But that tells you that that person will stay with you at maximum four months and they'll be out. And a high staff, staff turnover is a cost to a business because training is a cost. Time is a cost. So train your staff, mentor your staff, then do what are called staff audits. From time to time, you must do a staff audit. And when you're doing that staff audit, you are auditing your staff at different levels, looking at their qualifications, looking at their talents, looking at their temperaments, and aligning those with the tasks that you have given them. Wow. And, and in terms of, 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 of customers, I think for most businesses, the struggle is retention. Mm -hmm. How do we keep customers? There's a very interesting book, I've forgotten the author, but it says how to 
how to retain customers and if I'm paraphrasing says how to retain customers and and, and, and and not lose them. It has become very competitive and very dynamic and every entrepreneur must invest in studying and understanding consumer behavior. One line that caught my attention in that book says this time around where we are in 2023, 21st century, your business, you are not one in a million. You are one of a million. There's nothing that anybody can do now that makes you one in a million. If you have a degree, are you one in a million? Not really. You are just one of a million. There are million graduates. If you are making ice cream in this era, maybe in the time of our, our founding father, Mr. Kaunda, Dr. Kaunda and the team, that's why we used to hear that people used to get on a bus to go and eat ice cream somewhere. This time around, just in the neighborhood, there's somebody making ice cream. Bakery, are you one in a million? No, you are one of a million bakeries. Whatever you are doing, publishing, you are one of a million publishers. So we must then understand that competition at that point is very high. There's another book I'll recommend for those who, who love to read. There's a book, Blue Ocean Strategy, talking, talking about marketing and sales. But here's the thing. To retain customers now, firstly, you must understand that your customer is the boss. I tell my staff, and I uh, co continuously repeat that to them. Oftentimes, I would ask them and say, who is the boss here? And they say, the customer. And I tell them, if I call you and the customer is calling you, you go to where the customer is calling you. Because the customer is the one who employs us, all of us here, and who can fire everyone, including me or CEO, by just deciding to take his money somewhere else. So what are some of the things that uh, we can do to be able to retain customers? Number one, it is communication. Customers are frustrated by businesses that don't communicate. It is called m managing the expectations of your customer. If you told them their dress that you are knitting or sewing will be ready on Tuesday, and it is not ready on Tuesday, it should not be the customer communicating with you to say my dress. Then you say, sorry, actually, we, we, the power went they don't want explanations. At that point, what you have created is disappointment because an expectation has not been met. But if proactively, when you saw you are not meeting the deadline, you called the customer and said, your dress will not be ready because we are faced with this challenge. What you have communicated is that you care and you value the customer. And you have managed the expectation. So communication is is very, very critical. Number two, how do you retain customers? You must take feedback. Every business must have a system of collecting feedback. Now, my team will tell you that every, uh, for example, for our office that is uh, nearby here, every Friday I collect the company lines and I go and I read through all the communications that have happened on WhatsApp. I read through all the emails that have come through, which were coming to the sales and marketing team. I check in there. When we meet on Monday with the manager, I'm asking him, there's this customer who sent a message and it was not replied to. There's this guy who called and he was not replied to. There's this email that was sent. Why was it not replied to? So you must collect feedback because if you don't give customers what they want, they always have an alternative. Then put value and excellence to what we, you are doing. One of the greatest challenges that we have is uh, the spirit of excellence is not natural to us. We always do the bare minimum. And uh, there is an, an African, uh, okay, maybe that one is a bad one. I'll not use it. But let me say this to say, you see, when you look at, uh, look at you, uh, 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 Swiland, you are not a product of luck. Mm -mm. And I don't want people to just say, no, Suilanji is blessed. That's close to blasphemy. You're almost saying God has favorites. So he loves Suilanji and he doesn't like you. Why doesn't God like you? Because you are dark. Or you are light. No, God himself says he has no favorites. There's one thing that Suilanji has done. He has grabbed his opportunities and delivered them with excellence. I think people may like you, people may not like you, but there's one thing we can agree on, that whatever you are put on, you deliver it with excellence. People have known you in this country. You are on ZNBC. Whether it was your 
those the business uh, you know talk that you're doing it had a certain level of class and excellence when you come in you know in your space in that space of journalism i've been to interviews where you are shocked to say this person who called me here did he have a plan the questions that the person is asking they are superficial and unresearched i've watched your programs on that nbc when you'd be interviewing somebody, you'd run through their background, run through statistics that speaks to that, and then ask relevant questions. I've seen even people like Mr. Chibamba Kanyama back you on that to say Suilanji is the future and what. It's you applied yourself to bring out excellence, and excellence needs no introduction. It gets recognized immediately. Now we have got businesses where somebody will serve you with a fritter and you are debating, is this a donut, is a pie, or is a fritter? And, and I tell my team, any product that you have to deliver to a client with an explanation, it's a sign that it's mediocre. <laughs> <laughs> if you are delivering a suit with an explanation, no, don't worry about this button, <laughs> it's only that the button. That suit is mediocre. Excellence needs no explanation. When something has been excellently done, everybody appreciates it. And that is the culture we should inculcate. We have a few business partners that are not Zambian. For example, the Chinese. And I got shocked. These are the guys who made me to start even working in the night. When these guys have promised you that your work will be ready today, if by 17 it is not ready, they would rather work in the night and deliver the work for you at 24 hours. Us, what makes us knock off is not delivery, it is dying. Immediately it's 17, you hear somebody whistling and, and doing the, <laughs> where are you going? I know, we'll see you tomorrow, sir. What have you delivered? Our friends work with deliverables. 17 hours is too far, just lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we will retain customers excellence in what we are doing. I know it can be hard. I, I don't want to claim that we have always delivered excellent things. Even for us, it has been a hard way of learning because naturally we are all wired, not wired for excellence, including myself. But it's a decision you need to make and say, I need to move from this level of doing things this way to that level. I agree with you on the Chinese um, for, for two, two reasons. One, um, at work, there's this uh, gentleman, a project manager, um, and he said, when you're working on a project with the Chinese, and they give an example of Huawei, mm -hmm. he says, forget about sleeping. Oh, yeah. Project, mm -hmm. forget about sleeping. That's their culture. Here, mm -hmm. no abuse, labor office, mm -hmm. no, these mm -hmm. foreigners, look mm -hmm. because it's not, we're not culturally wired like that. The other thing I've learned is, I buy a lot of things from China. Uh -huh. uh, the, the, the time difference is, uh, I think, six hours. Uh -huh. So if this is 18, uh, that's 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, yeah, about midnight. Right now, as we record uh -huh. this podcast, it's midnight in China. Uh -huh. You text him, he will respond. No attitude, nothing, no, the time. Just, because right now, just text Zambian business on Facebook. No, uh, do you guys have this? Is it? No, 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 no respond. We have closed. No, like automatically, first of all, you know what I, the, and this is just 19 hours, Zambian time. You get attitude. You get what? Go to a Zambian shop. They are closing. You are literally, they, you literally see them <laughs> and closing. And banging the door. And, and you're about to enter at a bar. And oh. you know what shocks me, Swilaj? Why do businesses in Zambia close at 17 hours? Uh, that's a good question, eh? You know, time. I think we are still being comforted by low population. So competition is little. That's why people are sleeping. You remind me of Ade. You know Ade, right? Mm. Ade Kunle. He sat right in that chair. He, he, th this conversation really is reminding me of him. Sounds... Yeah. I, the way you've made uh -huh. me feel with this podcast is exactly how I felt when he was sitting in that chair. Mm. He's Nigerian. Mm. And he says, look, in my country, you wake up at, at, at seven to, to, to start making rice or whatever uh -huh. food in the morning. He's like, dude, at 04 in Nigeria, you can have hot rice. Not that, no, uh -huh. but I pick a yesterday uh -huh. sick with the rice warming. No. Yeah. The guy woke up zero two. He makes it and he saves it on a platter. Yes. I had an interview with a lady um, mm. that's found just n n nearby here. Yeah, I did an interview. Even post on Facebook. I was like, no, this lady makes um, six thousand kwacha. She makes fritters, mm. and people are like, no, it's not possible. <laughs> and this woman, when I interviewed her, she says, look, I, I sleep at nineteen hours. Uh -huh. 
but I wake up at zero two to start preparing the DAO and what yes. and by the time it's five six, someone can come and buy fritters. Uh-huh. Okay, uh-huh. but the young man feels like yeah, I can do that business. But when he hears zero two, when he no, hears zero, he's out. I, I, I know it's, it's not worth it. And you and know, on top of that, they'll judge me saying hey, Vitumbu, I, I want to And and you know, three days ago, I actually went to buy fritters from that woman. And actually, what made me to go and buy was that very video that you did. I found her there, hardworking, organized woman, very clean apron. What? Yes. To, to me, I'm just saying Vitumbu, yeah. You get the point, eh? But this is the culture that we must actually develop. Wake up early. I tell young people that poverty is manufactured in bed. And also <laughs> I tell them that you cannot sleep as if you are in competition with the dead and hope to win in the land of the living. That's true. You can't. You see, the greatest prophecy about your life is your sleeping habits. People go on Sunday asking their pastors to say, man of God, prophesy. No, you don't need that. Just look at how you have been sleeping the past one week. That's the greatest prophecy and the most accurate prophecy about your future. There is no great future to great sleeping. And by the way, in this life, whether you like it or not, you will be awake. You just need to choose when. You can either choose to be awake in youth so that you sleep in old age or sleep in youth so that you are awake in old age solving your own problems. Otherwise, in this life, whether you like it or not, you will be awake. So choose wisely when you want to be awake. Some of us have chosen that we will be awake in youth so that maybe later on we can sleep. We must adopt that. Move to Tanzania, just our neighbors here. Move to Kenya. Look at the work ethics. What time do people wake up? How do they work? They have what are called 24 hours. Ago. Silanji here, 17 hours, literally you are running for anything you are doing. And to beat the traffic. Because wherever you are going to get, when you reach there at 17 hours, you are going to, to be told we have done what? We have closed. Now, are there African countries where the culture is different? Yes. And we can look at some of our friends, like the Rwandese that are here. What time does the Rwandese shop open? It is open by 6, by 5. What time does it close at 22? So there's this young man I know. His name is Clever. He's from Rwanda. He came in three years ago, I think. He opened his first shop. Right now, he has five shops that he's running. He has even bought a kaka and uh, a little bike that he's using. So one time he visited me at home. I asked him to say, Clever, I want you to tell me something. What is it that makes you guys different from our youths? You are a young person. You are just 20, I think 24. What's the difference? He says, there are a number of things that I'm going to tell you, Mr. Kaban, why we have a difference between us and the youths, what I've observed here. He said, number one, Zambian youths are not ambitious. Now, this is not me. This is a young man who has proven himself. He says they are not ambitious. He says, do you know how many people from my country, even just in terms of exploration, to explore other opportunities, he says, do you know how many young people from my country apply for the green card? How many here in Zambia do? None. And, and this is you thinking of opportunities in a global context. How many Zambian young people can even visualize themselves working in Malawi? Or in Congo? Or in Namibia? We can't. Because even the knowledge we have about these places is very weird. Like, hmm, Malawi there. Hey, Congo, hey, you are passing. Bullets are pew, pew, pew. <laughs> See, Things that are not real. Mozambique, that's what. So an average Zambian youth does not even have a, a passport. It means that young person is excluded from international opportunities. Because when you see a job today and the deadline it's in Botswana is closing in 15 days, can you process a passport? That's why you find now somebody running around at the passport office. Bribing. So he says, yes, he says, our youths are not ambitious and proactive. I tell young people, if you are not employed, you have one job and it is to find a job. You wake up every day in the morning when everybody is dressing, you dress up. They ask you where you're going. You say, I'm going for work. Where? To look for a job. 
And you walk around smartly dressed and dropping your letters and talking to people lunch time you come back for lunch. Afternoon you go back 17 hours you come back you have knocked off you are from where? Work. But you have young people that are co complaining about unemployment. You ask that young person to say when was the last time you dropped an application letter? It is 4 months ago. Is that aggression? Are you aggressive? In this global village now, anybody can get a job from anywhere. But when that opportunity shows up, are you ready for it? There are young people whose CVs, you, you operating at that high level where you, you have, you have seen interviews, you get a CV and it looks like that program at a funeral, like born, 19 <laughs> whatever, whatever, primary school, like it's a urology at a uh, Life history. Life history. This young person can't even just organize their CV properly. I always tell young people, are you ready for employment? Do you have a file seated somewhere with your things properly photocopied and filed? Do you have a folder on Google Drive with all your scanned documents set there ready for employment? Do you have one attire that sits somewhere just ready if you are called for an interview? You show up and you are ready. Then are you continuously working on your skills to build your skills that when you sit in there, you can confidently articulate? We have, our young people have a casual approach to things. I have interviewed on panels where somebody sits there and I tell them, oh, you are here looking for a job at DNK. Tell me about DNK. Then you see the person beginning to scan the, the office looking for information. For the vision statement. You also do research and you're like, what are our services? The person has no clue. Some of them actually can open and say, ah, anyway, if it me, I just know about it yesterday when <laughs> my sister sent me the advert. That's a casual approach. The black African youths from West Africa are aggressive. I've interacted with them. The black African youths from East Africa are aggressive. I've interacted with them. Here in, in, in Southern Africa, unfortunately, the casual approach you see in Zambia is the same casual approach you see in Malawi. I've been there. It's the same casual approach in Namibia. I've been there. It's the same casual approach you see here. Zimbabwe a bit. But even there, there is. South Africa a bit. And it is not because they want to. It is because they're dealing with boers who do not joke. Yeah, tell me about those. <laughs> so we need to change some of these things. Two things you mentioned. Uh, one is about the passports. Um, so at Zamta, we were looking for um, some, some clients eh? mm -hmm. to sponsor, to go and watch. You know, as part of like customer appreciation, right? Yes. Go and sponsor, to go and watch. This game Zamta the was game. playing in Comoros. <laughs> uh -huh. So we found, did our research, found some customers who been, like been the longest on the network. Uh -huh. Found also customers who buy bundles every day. Like these customers who really are loyal to the network. You call them, hi, calling you from Zamta. This trip to Comoros, I've got no passport. I've got no passport. I've got no passport. And most of them just, just died. I've got no passport. I've got no passport. And then the, 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 the aggression you mentioned about jobs. I saw this somewhere on social media. I know that maybe it was designed in a joking way, but it's true. Uh, there's a post that said, guys, it's like someone talking to their unemployed colleagues. Eh? Uh -huh. It says, guys, today, just dress up, walk into any company that's working. <laughs> You get a point? It says, no, just dress yeah, up. Yeah, dress up, sure. The nearest company you can find, don't even waste transport money, the nearest company you can find, just walk in there and start working. <laughs> okay? When they call the police and they arrest you, at the police also go there, start working. <laughs> you get a point? But the truth is, that is the level of aggression that you need. Yes. Because to be honest, desperate times go for desperate times. Yes. Time. You find, it's like that thing King's Malembe sang, that song about, look, you can't sit on a needle and uh, you're comfortable uh, and you're not standing uh, up. It means you're enjoying it. Uh, because really, if you're feeling if you're feeling the heat of poverty, stand up and like something must change now. Yes. You get the point, right? But anyway, some people like like you say, you wonder like, okay, I mean, you you look happy. You get yeah. the point. You, you look yeah. happy where you are, and people have missed opportunities because uh, you look like you're happy. Like you're okay. <laughs> you look like everything is and okay. And you know, you mentioned something, uh, Swilange, which I think is important. Where you said some of the young people, for example, when you gave that example of uh, fritters. Maybe let me introduce this. In 2017, I authored my first book, Be Exceptional, and did a, a, a book launch of it at Best West Gates uh, Hotel. The, the, the original copy, the first copy was auctioned. Now, when it was auctioned, it was auctioned at a 2000. That time, it was a bit of money. And 
a young man raised his hand that he would get it at 2,000 kwacha. So, I was skeptical. I said, this young man can get a copy at a 2,000 when he can buy the next copy at a 100 kwacha. Where, does, where is this young man getting the money from? So, the, I told him to say, uh, I will not get your money now. You come tomorrow, I want to have a chat with you. So the next day he came, we met in town somewhere on a certain restaurant. And he says, oh, oh so here's the money, 2,000, and give me the copy. So I said, young man, before I get your money, I want to know, where have you gotten this money you are bringing to buy a copy at 2,000? Says, I run a business. I said, oh, okay, this should be some hustler or something. What business do you run? He says, I make muffins, which are scones, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Says, I make muffins. Said, young man, you are making muffins. And it is from the muffins where I have gotten a 2,000 to come and buy a book. You need to explain to me, otherwise I will not get your money because I want to be very clear where this money is coming from. So he says, here is what I do. At that point, that young man was a student at Apex Medical University. And he was not Zambian, he was Namibian. He says, I'm here and I run a business. He says, what do I do? He says, what I do is that Every day I wake up, according to him, he says, every day I wake up at 24 hours, I begin making the dough for my muffins. Then he says he bakes up to 04. By 04, his things are ready. And he says he fills those buckets, each one with 70 scones. That time a scone was going for one kwacha. So he fills 10 baskets, 10 buckets, each one with seven scones. Then he goes in the shops in Chalala and leaves a bucket here, a bucket there. He says, by the end of the day, in each bucket, I have sold a 70 kwacha. Multiplied by 10, 700, 700 kwacha. 700 kwacha multiplied by 10 days, 7,000 7, kwacha. Multiplied by three, 21,000 kwacha. This young man has a turnover of about 21,000 kwacha. Well, you may still deal with these running costs and whatever in there, but if you have a turnover of a 21,000 kwacha, then definitely producing a 2,000 can't be a problem. He says, it is this business that is paying for me at Apex and paying for where I am staying. It is from where I've gotten this money to come and give you. And I said, okay, I would want to see that. I had to go with the young man to some of the shops and he showed me, this is my bucket here and you can see where the scones are. And that young man is training to be a doctor. Today, as we are speaking, that young man now is a doctor. Now, I don't think such a young man can suffer in this life. But most of our youths have disqualified themselves from certain things. They have a criteria of where they can be seen and where they can't be seen. There are youths that believe that they, a booth is not their level. Now, this is a young man who doesn't have a qualification. No nothing, grade 12, and the booth is not his level. Well, at that level, <laughs> actually, a booth is dignified. There are young people that graduate from university, and to them, by just having that paper, they say, oh, now selling in a shop is not my level. They sit at home watching TV. Their parents, who struggled to take them in school, continue to struggle to feed them. They are covering themselves in a, pretext, in a pretext that we are looking for jobs. Such are the young people who even when they are given, follow any great person. It will shock you the things they were willing to do, the levels they were willing to reduce themselves to, to get to where they have been. When I was in university as a student, I rarely used to ask for money from my parents. Anybody who was at the School of Medicine knows that. I'm the guy who was supplying fish to the whole of UTH, the canteen in UTH, and that canteen at Evelyn Horn Fajema. I was supplying them village chickens and fish, which I bought from my BC. When others were buying TVs to look advanced, I was selling that. This printing we are doing now, DNK Branded Publishers, which is a company publishing books, it started with a Lexmark printer I bought from GEM. In 2009, I bought a Lexmark printer, which I still have at the office now, keeping as a souvenir, from the BC that I received. I bought it at a 350 kwacha. And I started printing it Ridgeway. The dean of students didn't allow me that. I would put my posters on the, uh, on the notice boards during the day. 
they would come and remove them because UNSA does not allow students to do business. Until one day they followed me to the room and warned me that if you continue with this, we'll remove you from the room. When I would move around with cooler boxes in Ridge where they are selling fish, to others, that was their, not their level. When you are broke, what is your level? <laughs> <laughs> ah, Dr. Kawan. And you know, I, I'm, I'm tempted to call you Dr. Kawan because I feel like you, you need some honorary degree, <laughs> some honorary doctorate or something. But you, no, I, I, I feel like I, I think let's end here. Uh, <laughs> and, and by the way, this is not what we were supposed yeah, to talk about. <laughs> this, this is a side chat. <laughs> this is not what we agreed to talk about. No, I'm sure but, but for me, no, in, in, in the back of my mind, I was like, you know what, maybe I'll introduce the topic, but I was like, no, you know what, let me, let me give room uh -huh. for him to come back. Yeah. <laughs> because honestly, I've, I've had a number of interviews. Uh, I think this is number, what, uh, 58? Mm -hmm. um, and there are some people I, I really want to bring back. And uh, you also remind me of Pastor Gladys Paswani, because mm -hmm. she says some things I was holding back so you can bring me back. <laughs> You know, so no, like I, I will definitely bring you back um, so we can have that conversation that we wanted to, to have. But my last question to you is what five things would you give? Okay, I, I know you've dropped a lot of gems, but parting words, what five things would you like to say to young people? If you had to give five pieces of Number advice. Number one, select your friends wisely. Your company will determine your destination. Select your friends wisely. The Bible says, he that walks with the wise becomes wise, but a companion of fools will be destroyed. The Bible says, do not be deceived. Evil companions corrupt good morals. This has continued to be demonstrated in life. So select your friends very wisely. How do you know whether you have great friends? Simple minds talk about people. Average minds discuss events. Great minds discuss ideas. You can analyze your friends by those three things. Then you know whether you need to upgrade. Number two, manage your time wisely. Time is the substance of which life is made. To waste time is to waste life itself. If there's anything that you must be jealous of is time. Moreover, time is only infinite in the cosmic concept of God. But limited to fallen human beings. Time is finite. Some of us have 24 years to live and die. Some, 34. Some, 60. Make sure you live a life that you will not regret. But also make sure you live a life that secures you a place in eternity. Don't just live for now. There is eternity to come. So manage your time very carefully. And then number three, I'm going to, to say that prioritize things. There is always something that should be done now and something that should be done later. Know the difference between things that are urgent but not important and things that are important and urgent and things that are both urgent and important. You must work within that matrix and know. The Pareto law states that 80% of the results we desire come from 20% of the things we do. And if you can establish what that 20% is, you become more effective. Sometimes we are in the 80% of things that only produce 20% results. So learn the art of prioritizing. Number four, continuously develop yourself. You develop yourself by exposure, number one. Expose yourself. Sometimes I, I tell people, don't have wicked courage. Wicked courage is when you find yourself walking in a bar unapologetically, but in an office when you are entering, you are entering like this, you are scared to enter in there. Why? Some of these places that have opportunities, we never go there. Most young people, when they are free, they would rather go and gallivant at Manda Hill. But they don't know that you can also gallivant from Akesha Park. And <laughs> it's likely you might get a job from Akesha Park than from Monday where you're gallivanting in peps or in pick and pay or whatever else, anything in there. So that is important. And lastly, take God very seriously. God is not a theory. God is real. God is present. God is working in, in the lives of men. God is doing great things. Continue to seek his wisdom through a deliberate study of his word. 
Continue to pray for yourself, for your future, and every person that matters to you. But beyond prayer, also work. Because God is in the habit of giving blessings, and blessings are a multiplication of what you have. When you have zero, even if we multiply it with a million, we still get zero. But if you can even just produce one, when we multiply it with a million, it becomes a million. So have something to present and God works with that. Mr. Kawani, thank you very much. Uh, yo, I don't even know. Uh, I feel like this is one of those. There was one time I found myself watching uh, an episode of the podcast. Like I, like, like, I watched like I wasn't there. <laughs> and I feel like this is going to repeat itself um, with this deep content. I'm humble. I, I understand now what people feel when they come to me and tell me, your podcast has changed my life. I oh. feel like this is the changing process. Your podcast, Swilanji, is, is, is powerful. I, I tell young people, even in our mentorship, I say, go and watch. I was telling the other team a few days ago, go and watch the, the growth podcast. I'll tell you, like I said from the beginning, it is a positive force, which we did very much, especially in our Zambian space. Continue being relevant, continue changing lives. That's what you have always been. That's what you are still are uh, even now. And really, for me, I, I celebrate you and wish you the best in what you are doing to impact society. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Mr. Kavan. It actually takes a lot of work. Those who follow the podcast have noticed that before, I never used to be in this jacket that, <laughs> that I'm wearing. And the reason was simple. It's because uh -huh. I, like, I'll, I'll record on weekends, I'll record, uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. but these uh -huh. days I come from work. Yeah. And, I come and, and you are here. And I'm here, you know. So yeah, hence. Uh, but but to be honest, sitting down and and drinking from your cup, it's 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 it makes me feel like this is a worthy endeavor. Like this is a good cause. We should not give up. Um, we should continue. And uh, we are always happy for the support people give us. But I know that this one this one is for the record books. I'm this humbled. one is for the books, Mr. Kabani, and I wish you the best um, in everything that you do. Um, I'll obviously be coming to you to recommend guests who are like you, so that. <laughs> The podcast is a great concern with the good content and everything. But I know this, um, and we'll look back, you will come back. Thank that you are, so much. That I'm very confident. Um, thank you very much to you guys. Please subscribe. Recommend this to a friend. Don't be selfish with the knowledge. I feel like the things that he has dropped, to be honest, even if you apply just 1%, we can do a different life altogether. Um, please like, share, subscribe, and yeah, the podcast will be back um, very soon.